What kind of world do I want to live in? I think about this question a lot. For our generation and for specifically my group of people, which is refugees, the circumstances might dismantle any vision of the future that we have. You're trying to rebuild, you're trying to make a future for yourself, and then the climate related disaster comes and you start again. It's not about how it's affecting you now, it's about how it's affecting you your entire life. First step to understand is that we're all a part of it. None of us are going to be left out by the crisis. We're at a stage where if we don't act now, really there won't be very much left. There are generations that will never see certain things that we grew up seeing in real life. We have to start treating this like the emergency it is. To achieve the 17 Sustainable Development Goals, we have to go from an intention to a serious commitment. Business leaders really need to rethink how they conduct their business and invest in creating systems that are climate friendly. The action I would like to see is accountability. Structures being put in place where countries aren't just asked to do something, but they're kept accountable to the decisions that they make. There has to be that strong collaboration between government, between, between youth activists to drive change forward. The world I would want to live in is a world where imagining the future is not a privilege. I want to live in a world where people do not give up on hope, hope that a positive change is possible. The fact that you're listening today means that you are willing to make a change. Welcome, wherever you are and whatever time it is for you. I'm Heather Clancy, the Editorial Director of GreenBiz, and I am thrilled to join you all here at the Sustainable Development Impact Summit. Blue aquatic food provides over 3 billion people, nearly 20% of their protein, with global seafood consumption doubling over the last 50 years as the world population has grown. With that increased demand, have come the dire impacts of overfishing, seafood loss, waste, marine ecosystem degradation. These realities are underscoring the business case for improving access to sustainable blue aquatic foods among corporate leaders, policymakers, scientists, and civil society actors. The objective of today's session is to launch the Blue Food Partnership. The aim of this initiative raise awareness about the importance of blue food in global policy narratives, and deliver actions toward a more sustainable blue food value chain. We'll hear first today from Christian Telecki, Director of Friends of Ocean Action, who will provide us more information about the partnership and its mission. Those comments will be followed by remarks from several subject matter experts on blue food and food systems in general, who will offer perspective on the role that the blue food partnership could play in advancing action. I'll briefly introduce them now, and you'll hear from them in a moment. Shakuntala Thisted is the global lead for nutrition and public health with World Fish, and she's the vice chair of the UN Food Systems Summit. Arnie Mathieson is senior advisor for the Iceland, excuse me, senior advisor for the Iceland Ocean Cluster, and Chris Minnis is the CEO of the Aquaculture Stewardship Council and co-chair of the Blue Food Partnerships Sustainable Aquaculture Working Group. With that, I'll turn over to Christian for an intro about the partnership. Christian? Thank you so much, Heather, and, and delighted to be joining everybody today. Um, I hope it doesn't come as a surprise to everyone that a healthy ocean um, and other aquatic sources are essential to keep our climate in balance, feed a growing population, support economic development, and protect habitat and wildlife. The need for producing aquatic or blue food in more sustainable, nutritious ways is increasing. 
in the light of world's growing population. And without a doubt, the momentum around this agenda is building. And I'm hoping you're seeing that as well in some of the circles you're moving in. When we talk about blue food or aquatic foods, we mean fish, shellfish, aquatic plants, and algae, whether captured or cultivated in freshwater or marine ecosystems. So not just thinking about fish, we're thinking about the full extent of potential for what the sea and the ocean can provide. This momentum is evident in a number of ways, including through official dialogues being organized around blue food as part of the UN Food System Summit process. And of course, the summit itself is taking place today and the recently launched Blue Food Assessment and the priority actions identified by the high-level panel for a sustainable ocean economy. Friends of Ocean Action, alongside Special Envoy for Food System Summit, Agnes Kalavata, Special Envoy for the Ocean, Peter Thompson, the United Nations Foundation, and the Government of Norway, uh, co-convened a global dialogue around aquatic food during the Virtual Ocean Dialogues in May, which the World Economic Forum hosted. Um, these discussions, which I hope some of you participated in, um, were fed directly into the food system process. In this context, that Friends of Ocean Action is delighted to be launching the Blue Food Partnership, which aims to catalyze science-based action towards healthy and sustainable blue food value chains. We're extraordinarily grateful in that context to the UK government's Blue Planet Fund in supporting this exciting work of the partnership. The Blue Food Partnership itself and the Friends of Ocean Action will continue to support the work on aquatic foods coming out of the UN Food System Summit process and the coalition, which is currently being developed by member states, really trying to correct some of those, connect some of those outcomes that are coming from the summit and leading to a longer term, uh, uh, I guess, sort of drive when it comes to action and walking the talk. Um, as I said earlier, connecting to policy and science, the partnership is shaped by the high-level panel for sustainable ocean economies, 2030 ocean food, uh, ocean food priority areas, and the blue food assessment, which supports decision makers in evaluating trade-offs and indeed implementing solutions to a build healthy, equitable, and sustainable food systems. Friends of Ocean Action helped initiate the Blue Food Assessment, which is now in formal collaboration with the Blue Food Partnership. The Blue Food Assessment, if you haven't had a chance, I really encourage you to, to look at it. Um, you can find it at bluefood.earth, which was launched last week, is being led by Stanford University and the Stockholm Resilience Center and supported by EAT. Perhaps just a few uh, highlights from that um, that you were worth sort of takeaways. Uh, one, the need to focus on what, as well as how much. One of the key messages coming out of the Blue Food Assessment is the huge variation in nutrients across fish species. The need to find ways to foster innovations in production of the species we, we need that offer high nutrition, low footprint, and lots of livelihoods, not just big commercial species. And finally, and by no means least, the potential for expanding our expectations of industry to drive better practice, to support small scale actors in a value chain and to help shift the market to healthier, lower impact species and systems. So a lot to think about. And then for, certainly from the perspective of the Blue Food Partnership, we're excited to draw that in and really drive this agenda forward. The assessment, uh, the findings of the assessment will provide an invaluable foundation, as I said earlier, and look forward to partnering with the team behind it to mobilize action on its insights, recommendations, and collectively raise the profile of blue and aquatic foods as important foods as part of our food system. Um, we'll hear a little bit more from the uh, Aquaculture Working Group from Chris Ninnis and others. Uh, we're looking forward to working with you all. Please be in contact with my colleagues here. Uh, you see their contact details there, but uh, very much looking forward to the discussion and working with you all to really roll out the Blue Food Partnership. Back to you, Heather. Great, thank you, Christian. Before we move on to our subject matter experts, a quick question for you is, would you say, what would you say is sort of your first point of action for the, the group? I mean, you obviously mentioned the assessment, but uh, you know, what's, what's, ag what's agenda one? I think agenda one really is is the co-creation of what the partnership is going to do and really responding to uh, the, you know, sort of the private sector and those partners that are involved with this to do something that's meaningful, actionable, practical, um, that really starts to get things done. We don't have a whole lot of time and uh, we want to be sure that we're moving with pace when we think about the uh, the 2030 agenda and delivering some of the sustainable development goals, but also what the partnership can achieve in a small amount of time. Great. Okay. Hopefully we'll hear a little bit more from you in a moment, but first let's hear from Shakuntala. Uh, please, um, I'd love to hear some remarks on what you think uh, should be the priority for this group. Thank you, Heather, and greetings to all. 
Let me first congratulate the Friends of Ocean Action on the launch of this Blue Food Partnership. It is indeed a wonderful moment as we see commitments to raise the awareness and acknowledge the role of diverse aquatic foods in global policy narratives and deliver actions, solutions, and innovations that can transform food systems towards being healthy and equitable, also sustainable and resilient, and that these aquatic systems can nourish all peoples and our planet. As you know, the UN Food Systems Summit 2021 is taking place today. After two years of consultations and dialogues in many countries and with multiple stakeholders, sharing over 1,200 ideas for a global food system transformation. It is heartening to see that aquatic foods have emerged as one of the seven priorities for transformation, as identified by the scientific group for the UN Food System Summit. Underpinning this transformation is the need for more financial investments, increased scientific capacity, especially in low and middle income countries, and more science policy interface. Last week, the Blue Food Assessment, after two years of intense work by several researchers across the globe, released its findings across several disciplines, including nutrition, economy, and environment. These, find these findings serve as a robust foundation for actions, solutions, policy, and framework changes that will strengthen the importance of aquatic foods for addressing food and nutrition security, as well as putting us on course towards achieving SDG2, nutrition security, and as well as putting us on hunger, achieve food security and improved nutrition and pr promote sustainable agriculture, also including fisheries, meaning capture fisheries and aquaculture. Therefore, the Blue Food Partnership is timely as it is poised to bridge the science-based findings and evidence of the Blue Food Assessment and the UN Food Systems Summit well, post-summit, as well as the recommendations from the UN Nutrition Paper, the role of aquatic foods in sustainable healthy diets, and the Committee on World Food Security Voluntary Guidelines for Food Systems and, Nutri and Nutrition. The partnership would also bring together a range of stakeholders from governments, communities, non-governmental and intergovernmental organizations, funding agencies, the private sector, and scientists to develop and implement solutions and actions that center on aquatic foods in our global food systems. I look forward to the unfolding of the Blue Food Partnership as we work together through the many global platform platforms of today. For example, the UN Decade of Action and Nutrition, the UN Decade of Ocean Science for Sustainable Development, as well as the 2022 International Year of Artisanal Fisheries and Aquaculture. I look forward to see strong actions as part of the agenda of this partnership, especially in new areas protecting and increasing the diversity of aquatic foods in inland waters, reducing aquatic food loss and improving the safety of aquatic foods. Thank you so much. Thank you for those remarks. I appreciate it. I have a question for you on stakeholders. How, how will we can, uh, be including those whose livelihoods um, really depend on this? I mean, right, that's, that's one of the key issues at hand. So Heather, I do think with the, with the, uh, with the dialogues and, um, and, and the consultations that, ha that have, been having, have been taking place at governmental uh, levels, at country levels with, with different stakeholders, at regional levels, that we have made a dent. But it's our ability, us who sit in high-level um, platforms, 
us who sit at the table of policy makers and decision makers, that we still just listen to the voices of the challenges that people face. We do not take into the traditional knowledge their aspirations and their goals and what solutions they see as to overcome their challenges. We listen just to part of the story and not look towards the solutions. Okay, definitely something to think about there. Thank you for that perspective. So um, let's move on next to Arnie from Iceland. Arnie, uh, please uh, feel free to make some opening remarks. Yes, thank you. <clears throat> thank you very much, Heather, and uh, good afternoon to all. In, in my mind, the Food Systems Summit, something's happening. In my mind, the Food Systems Summit, the Blue Food Assessment, and the Blue Food Partnership are all, all linked. Mm -hmm. And basically, today, we are entering the, the post-FSS period. And the, the task ahead of us is then to follow up on the directions that will come out of the, the food system. And this we need to do in, a, in an organized way. And in that, I see the private sector input as extremely important. And from the first time that we started talking about the Blue Food Partnership, we saw it as the, the perfect vehicle for the private sector to contribute in an organized way into this, this, this pathway that the FSS will have uh, directed us to. There is now in preparation a Blue Food Coalition or an Icotic Food Alliance or whatever it will eventually be called. It, it doesn't matter what it will be called in the end. But I see the Blue Food Partnership as a kind of a, a framework or, a, or an umbrella for the various private sector activities to come together in an organized way and contribute into this new, new path that is being forced for us. The, the fact is that there's a fantastic diversity in blue or aquatic foods, but it is also a fantastic diversity in those that are interested. And they can all contribute, but how to organize this and pull it all together is, is very important. And I see this in a structured kind of a pyramid, a pyramid of, of uh, multiple parties where you have governments at the, at the top, where you have, have um, academic institutions, where you have the UN organizations, NGOs, international financial organizations, as well as private sec sector stakeholders, all contributing together. Mm -hmm. And it is upon our shoulders as we enter into the post-FSS period to all come together in a synchronized way and in, a, in an active, practical, and sensible and successful way forced through with Blue Food outcomes. Thank you for the, so that commentary. Uh, a question for you would be just how you see this playing in sort of our other large goals, right? Biodiversity. We, we know that there's an urgent need to, to contribute to that. And you wrote, represent the ocean cluster. So clearly the ocean is an ecosystem of which blue food is part. How do you see this uh, contributing to those other very urgent goals? Well, the, the, the fact is that Blue food, sort of by its nature, is always 
a little bit aside from sort of terrestrial systems and terrestrial concerns. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So it then always has to be cross-sectoral. So biodiversity, climate issue, humanitarian issues, food security issues, they all have to come together and work together and solve those issues together in the blue food part of of the, the, the global the global system. And biodiversity is a, a very important part of it. It's not just about whether species are becoming extinct or not. The question is whether they are in an enough abundance to contribute meaningfully to food and nutrition security, particularly in the, in the southern hemisphere, where we definitely have, have need for a more varied diet, not just for, for uh, calories, but also for very important nutritional in, in ingredients and, and, and vitamins and minerals, etc., et that the blue food can, can provide. Super. Thank you so much for your perspective. Let's move on now to Chris with some thoughts on the aquaculture, the really uh, industry and the, the impact. Chris? You might need to unmute. Have we lost your audio? All right, well, let's come back to you in a moment. Um, give, it, give it a shot, another shot. Okay, do we still have Christian on? Yep, I'm still here. Okay, super. Um, I let's when c- Chris cut in when you're, when you're back on, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I w- would wanted to go back to something that I asked, uh, Sh- Shakuntala about, um, which was the, the livelihoods, right? So that this, this aspect of it, we, we know that this is one of the most challenging issues about food is that we need food for everyone. We also know that food is a livelihood for many people, right? So producing food. So how do Hold we, on, Heather. ah, there we go. So I'm going to come back to you for that question, but first let's hear from Chris. Sorry to interrupt you there, Christian, and, uh, and sorry for that little IT panic. Um, uh, I had a problem with my mouse that wouldn't, uh, wouldn't amuse you to all uh, listening uh, intently. Um, but I do have some good news, actually, and, uh, and certainly it's that the Blue Food Partnership has already started its science-based action. Uh, through the development of a pre-competitive working group on sustainable aquaculture. And and as you've heard repeatedly throughout the last few days, sustainable aquaculture has much to contribute. Um, It has has significant potential to meet our growing food needs in a nutritious way um, and that has low impact on the environment, has the ability to produce animal protein uh, in a much more f- climate-friendly man- manner relative to many of the terrestrial counterparts. It certainly works towards zero hunger and will be enhanced both globally and locally through smart species and site selection for those key product- for the key production of uh, aquaculture products. Um, the vision, actually, for the working group is, is very much to promote and enable the sustainable increase of aquaculture production um, in order to meet both nutritional demands um, of a fast-growing world population, but of course, uh, as well as to meet towards the relevant sustainable development goals that are key uh, that we achieve, we do mean by sustainable aquaculture. And towards this, uh, the working group's goal is to co-create uh, science-based global roadmap that will provide guidance towards the design and delivery of sustainable aquaculture production to 2030 and, of course, into the future. Thank you. 
Thank you. I have a question for you on, on aquaculture. It's something I wonder about a lot is many associated with the ocean, but there's a lot going on. I mean, obviously freshwater versus saltwater um, aqu aquaculture. What um, do you see happening as far as that the industry goes in? In, in, in the United States, at least it's very nascent um, as far as fresh, right? But how, how do you see that, that dialogue playing out and how could that be um, important for this blue food partnership path? Well, it, it, it's a very interesting uh, question you pose actually, because uh, uh, you know, when you look at the culture across all its bands, uh, certainly, um, uh, the greater part uh, of the of the animal production is is actually freshwater based, yeah. which comes as a surprise mm -hmm. to many. Uh, mm -hmm. And the saltwater components of the of the animal production uh, is a, a, a much more recent development, and, and often in the minds of uh, of, of many, um, you know, based around perhaps salmon production in in northern mm -hmm. climates, southern uh, latitudes that uh, support it. But really, um, freshwater drives so much uh, of the nutritional provision that aquaculture provides, um, and uh, uh, you know, basic livelihoods and and food for so many, many uh, hundreds and hundreds of thousands of people. So it's it's critical that we develop and that we embrace all of aquaculture in in, in meeting these goals. Great, thank you for that. I appreciate it. Yeah, I I, I know that 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 perception is clouded, if you will, and, and it needs to, needs to be put forth more. If we could have everyone come back in for the next few minutes. Uh, I wanted to go back to a question I was just posing to Christian when, we, when, uh, when you came back on, which was just the, the issue of livelihoods, because we know that that is a, a very important part of this, um, of the dialogue that needs to happen. It's, it's the economic imperative for all sectors, but also especially for the individuals involved in these systems. So how, how do, do um, you and, and others see the, that stakeholder being included in the Blue Food Partnership, the, the, those who are, are dependent on these fisheries? And I'm making my screen bigger so I can see who's waving at me. I, I can see you smiling. <laughs> Go ahead, Shikutala. Okay. Thanks, Heather. That's important, especially, um, especially in uh, and uh, as as we just heard about about uh, freshwater freshwater aquaculture. So the figure that's given is that over three billion people depend on aquaculture and fisheries for their livelihoods and that uh, half of the, at least half of the women and that the majority of these people are from low and middle income countries if, so if i would quickly say how i see it in the work that i have been doing is that if we use diversity as fundamental consumption, but all the way through the food systems, starting, I will start from consumption and way back to supply chains and to production and the inputs for production. If we would use a framework of diversity, then we would get much further into having nutritious diets and having also diets and production systems with low environmental costs. So for me, New, um, for me, diversity is key. It's fundamental. I want to, uh, to focus and make all our efforts but to all the SDGs, but in particular to SDG 2, Zero Hunger, and Malnutrition. Then it is extremely important that we look again at diversity and we also look at the diversity of the peoples who are engaged in all parts of the food systems. So diversity and nutrition sensitive, nutrition sensitive approaches to production systems will get us a very long way. And we've been doing this, for example, in, um, in Bangladesh with nutrition sensitive uh, pond polyculture, where we have large fish and small fish in the same ponds, increase in production, productivity, nutritional quality, increase in home consumption and increase in sale. Yeah, 
I think, Arnie, you were putting your hand up there. Did you want to add something? You are muted. Yeah, um, is, there you are. This being unmuted or muted is like uh, like with the attachments. You forget to act to attach your attachment <laughs> all the time. It's the sort of same kind of a thing. Yes, but just to to add a little bit on to what, what Shakuntala was saying, and as you can imagine. I, I wholeheartedly uh, uh, agree with her, but I see this dependency in in three ways. It's it's dependency on on from the food security and the nutrition security aspect that we supply those that that need the the, the food and the and the nutritional ingredients in their their, their diets, but it's also those that depend for their 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 incomes their lively livelihoods on on fisheries and, and aquaculture that we we need to think about in this equation but thirdly and and the, possibly the part of it that is is growing fastest fastest is sort of the derived industries where the the various in, ingredients are being used not just for for food and and nutrition, but also for for um, for medicinal purposes as as well as even in in cosmetics. And well, the world is is just such that when you get into this category, people are willing to pay much higher amounts for the the raw materials than they they would otherwise want to do. So this is a a very fast-growing sector, which can obviously contribute quite a lot to to struggling coastal communities and in in, uh, in, in uh, the developing world, just as well as in, in the, the developed world. And so, there is a great potential there that we should also be taking into account. Great. Well, I'm afraid we're on time. I want to, I just want to hand it back to Christian. I believe he had one, one or two other things he'd like to say before we wrap up. Thank you so much for that, Heather. And just a, perhaps a couple of points. I think just reflecting on the partnership itself, um, you know, that we have a very much inclusive partnership um, that really starts to think about getting blue food to those places that it matters and is needed. Um, and thinking about this in the bait to plate, as we often say, and that entire supply chain, but also how do we reduce the roughly 35 to 40% waste that is in the supply chain at the moment? Incredible amount of wasted protein there that should be going and not lost to the places that matter. Finally, as SDG 14, think as the ocean goal, uh, Shakuntala talked about SDG 2, think about these interconnections between the SDGs. Um, you know, one can help solve the other, and we really need to think in a more integrated and holistic fashion, which is where the Blue Food Partnership comes in. Back to you, Heather. Thank you. So, so bummed out that we're out of time, but we are on time. And so I need to close us off, but I did want to thank our really wonderful panel, um, Christian Telecki, Shakuntala, Kuntala Thiestad, Arnie Matheson, Chris Ninnis, thank you so much for being here today and thinking, making me think. I hope you're all empowered and want to act on this partnership. Thank you very much.